So I don't know. There's a bunch of new books, a lot of new number ones coming out from Marvel this week, a lot of new, all new, all different number ones. Is there anything that uh, you're, you're excited for? Well, it was recently my birthday, so if anybody out there would like to celebrate, they should go out and buy Drax number one because I wrote it and it's my birthday and I'm looking for any kind of charity from anybody out there. Plus, it's really good. It's drawn good and it's wrote good, so go buy it. I do love books that are wrote good. All right, Drax number one. Put it on your pull list right now. From Challengers Comics and Conversation in Chicago, this is Contest of Challengers. And now, here are Patrick and Dal. So, Cullen Bunn, that was pretty awesome. I didn't realize he stopped by the store. Right? All the way from St. Louis. That guy wow. was in town. And, and it was just... his birthday and everything. I feel oh, bad. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Cullen. So modest. Yep. Weird he didn't mention his co-writer at all. Yeah. Well, he said it was rope good, so, I mean, yeah. I assume that includes both he and whomever Marvel paired him with. I can't remember. I, does it even matter at this point? I feel like it's weird that Marvel hasn't really publicized Cullen's co-writer that much. It's pretty weird that they've... Kind of just been like, you know, Cullen Bunn and whomever. Well, with the amount of all-new, all-different Marvel titles they have... By the way, did you hear how effortlessly I said it this time, but how I stumbled all over it in that opening? All-new, all-different. Uh, that's a way better. I hope that's the next season. Yeah, that's the moment where every, uh, every story is a, a store in a mall. Oh, I was thinking M-A-U-L. No, that'll be for the Darth Maul series that will inevitably come out for the Star Wars line. I figured it was when Wolverine comes back. I, honest to God, now, like, when they do the Darth Maul series, I want to email someone at Marvel and go, Maul new, Maul different. Come on, <laughs> come on. <laughs> they won't do it. You don't know that. They've done dumber things. Sure. They do 4,999 in one variants, specifically to thumb their nose at DC. Yep, that one extra copy. Because it's one less than whatever DC's doing. They'll call it Maul being Maul different. They absolutely will. <laughs> oh, man. I don't know. You've been having some good good ideas lately that I don't know if they're going to... I'm, I'm excited now. I'm excited to see when they do that comic. Just like you're excited for our Ryan Brown cover to Batman TMNT number yeah, one. Yeah, God, I wish I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> we were having a discussion on the Facebook about... Uh, well, basically, and I think this is going to be more of a topic as we get into this episode. Okay. But basically, this week, specifically, the end of the third full week of all new, all different Marvel, Marvel's taking a beating in the this, press. This past week? Because we're, we're, as we're recording this, we're coming up at the end of the fourth week. Oh, yeah, I guess that's true. I'm just trying to figure out yeah. when this, this anecdote is taking place. That's, well, since we're recording this, the fourth week has just started, really? Yeah, we're a couple days into it. Okay. Well... Anyway, I'm sorry. I guess. Within, I didn't, I didn't within the context of uh, the, their first month, yes, they're kind of taking a beating. Yeah, I've read and, some articles. Uh, did you read Brian Hibbs today? I did. Um, I it, feel like he was a little bit... Uh, he was restating a little bit what he'd already said in a, in a previous article for another writer, which I don't know when he wrote his Tilting at Windmills, so that could have been sure. written contemporaneously with doing an interview for someone else. Like, we've done things where... We've talked about something, and then uh, David Harper, I think, has, yes. has reached out to you, and you're basically just kind of writing down exactly what we've been talking about. And yeah. even though those he hadn't listened to that episode necessarily, sure. it's kind of in the air. Well, there was once recently where it went the opposite way, where he reached out to me to write a piece for them, uh -huh. and I wrote all about Batman Day, uh -huh. and then that's what our next episode became. Uh -huh. <laughs> and basically, I talked all about the things I had just written about, Yet, I wrote it for him, mm -hmm. I used it here, sure. this aired first, and then that piece went up. There you go. So, it, it literally, you, it wasn't... You used every part of the promotion. Yeah, and I, I knew that I had just written that all for him, mm -hmm. but I feel like the audiences are completely different. Yeah, I would say so. And it's the difference of... That was doing something for him. This is a thing for my business. And I felt more than okay reusing it. Sure. And I, I would say that, I mean, one, just writing it down versus talking about it makes it two different things. Yeah, especially also, because you weren't involved in the writing down part. Yeah, and, and that's kind of the other thing is that 
we end up talking about something and, you know, we, we pull different ideas out of each other. So you, you create a different synopsis kind of by the end of it, as opposed to you were giving information to a writer who is then either like combining that with other stuff or adding his own two cents or kind of like reframing that. So, I mean, there's, well, there's the, a difference there. The Batman Day thing was like a guest editorial. Or just a full submission. Yeah. Right? I mean, uh, he, he ran it as is. Okay. And it was credited to me. It wasn't his piece on Batman Day. Here's other retailers' thoughts. Okay. It's once a month he wants to have a retailer talk about something, and I was his inaugural retailer. Yay. But I put a link to his article about Marvel and the lateness of Secret Wars and how the slow rollout of the all new, all different is, is not helping anybody. And Jin Ha uh, commented about how it's, it seems like it's a difficult process. And then I chimed in saying, Wait, I, I'm what, what, I mean, being a retailer trying to, uh, to, to navigate these orders. Oh, sure. Which is, I mean, we talk about that every single week. Yeah. But I threw my two cents in and just basically said, yeah, I've been doing this 25 years and it's never been harder. Yeah, I... I but feel that, like in, in general, like I was thinking about that today as I was doing some stuff, um, not to, to segue or anything or digress too much, but I was putting it. Speaking a of, of segue, did you see that Darth Vader video where he's on the segue? I didn't. You know, those handleless segues they have now? Just oh, like the, that's weird. Uh, and he's just like gliding along, oh, yeah. crashes into a wall. Hilarious. Okay. Yeah, it seems like that's what's going to happen. As opposed to the guy who's dressed as Aladdin mm -hmm. and put a carpet over it uh -huh. and is just gliding around on a flying carpet. Okay. That's but anyway, cool. not uh, the segue. You were thinking about this today. Yeah, I was entering a bunch of um, subscriber orders in, and I was realizing, based on the, the additions, like how wrong we had gotten a lot of our initial orders for things, just assuming like, well, this is what people are going to want, and then seeing a bunch of people adding stuff and going like, oh, we really underestimated the demand for certain titles. And Was Nova one of them? No, um, the main two would be... We uh, had no, somebody signed up for Nova today, and I kind of uh, chuckled. We had a couple people online at Nova. Um... Hercules and James Bond were the two where I was the most like, wow, really? But a lot of people wanted Hercules and James Bond. Yeah, but, and I don't want to beat a dead horse and get too far off topic. Right. If they would tell us this... To me, it's okay because they're telling us now before we're doing our, our final, final, final order. So Which there's should, no guarantee we can right, get those. But we but, should be okay. But we are going to talk about that in a minute. Right. But anyway, dialing it back a bit. Um, I was looking at that and I realized, wow, like... If I look over what we order, both the initial orders and the final order cutoff, and and look at kind of what I feel like we ordered right and what I feel like we ordered wrong, I would say, like, at least 80% of stuff I feel like we order wrong one way or the other. Like, either too little or too many. Oh, absolutely. And, that, yeah. and that's, thinking about it in those terms of, of considering what we do to be successful comic retailing and still being able to say for new comics... 80% of it is incorrect, is crazy to me. Like, that's an insane... Like, if, it, if we were 80% right, I'd feel like that's still the low end of successful. But in this business, in this industry, you're ordering so blind that everything's going to be wrong. And you're just hoping that the 80% that's wrong balances itself by being essentially 40% too high and 40% too low. And then it all kind of works out okay. But that's still crazy. But what you would determine as successful is such a impossible oh, it's a margin target. to hit. It's because so Because I'm going to say that for you, or for us, I guess, but I mean, your definition of success is complete sellout after four weeks, but not too soon. No, like, and, and this is what makes it so difficult, is that essentially what you want, what any retailer wants, is to order enough copies of something to fill all potential orders without ever having to tell someone, no, I don't have that when they ask for it, but never having more than that. Like, that's an impossible Never having to number. move one to the back issues. Yeah, exactly. Like, you have just enough to fill every order, and you never have to mark it down. You never have to put it in the back. You have, like, if over the span of a book, 52 people come in, you have 52 copies. You don't have 53. You don't have 51. You have exactly the right number. And that's, that is an insane target. Right, like, and that, plus, you can't gauge sales figures on that because you never yeah. know when someone from out of town 
is visiting and is getting their week's books from us, or I think I'll try this one or, today. Or, or weirdly, how far back some people are going to go, because I, it's not even enough to just say, like, I want enough for six weeks or eight weeks or 12 weeks, because inevitably someone's going to come in on the 17th week and ask for a book, and I'm going to feel bad that we don't have it, when realistically, I shouldn't have it. No. I shouldn't have it for that person. Yeah, and, I should be so up by that. example, just a mere moments ago, it was a four-week window as sure. we were measuring by. So it's a nigh-impossible task. It really is. Um, but before I got off on, on the tangent of talking about um, how badly I feel like we order, um, you were saying something. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think your topic is way more interesting. Well, but well, I'm sure we'll come back around to it. it started a thread about... The only all different Marvel, right, right. No, no, uh, just about ordering and okay. how, how hard things are. And basically the thread was uh, Terry Gant from Third Coast Comics mm -hmm. and myself and a few of our regulars, mm -hmm. regular customers, regular commenters. And when it got down to the bottom of the thread, I had mentioned, like I said before in this episode, there's a retailer variant for Batman Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number one. And I decided, just for fun, let's do the math. Let's see what it would cost us to do this. And we've broken things like this down before. Mm -hmm. But basically, so Batman TMNT number one. In order to be able to order a store-exclusive cover... To and be eligible. A store-exclusive cover, meaning there'll be a cover drawn just for your store... Not the Back to the Future Derek Robertson cover where they stick your logo on it. Right. But like the Dark Knight 3 number 1 yeah, 30 something variant covers they're doing where they're each done by a different artist. So it's not just a matter of ordering that book. Saying, I want that. First, you have to match your numbers of the regular cover to number 1. Yeah, the regular A cover by Freddie Williams II. To... 100% of your orders of Batman number 43. Mm -hmm. Now, Batman is far and away our best-selling DC comic. It's the... Well, I mean, industry-wide, it's the best-selling DC book. There's no way Batman TMNT is going to sell anywhere near Batman numbers in our store. I would be surprised. I I think it's... Considering how much Batman is kind of trending down... Yeah. And the weirdly crossover appeal of something like Batman TMNT based on what we saw post-San Diego... I don't think it'll hit those levels, but no, I think, I think it'll do very well. I think, yeah, I mean, I think realistically it'll probably do 60 to 70% of that number. But we wouldn't be ordering Batman numbers for that book to begin with. So first of all, no. you have to order Batman numbers for issue one. Then, and only then, are you allowed to order a store variant of which you have to buy... 2,500 copies. A minimum of 2,500. You can order more. Yes. But you have to get at least 2,500 of them. And then, if you do that, you are then eligible to have a black and white variant of your cover. But to do that, you have to order a minimum of 1,500 copies. Of the black and white cover. Yes. So, basically, if we did the bare minimum of... Uh, what we have to order for the normal cover to be eligible, what we'd order for a store-exclusive color variant, and then what we'd order for a store-exclusive black and white variant, we're basically in about roughly 4,100 copies of yeah. Batman TMNT. Keeping in mind that for a store our size, the most we've ever sold of anything ever is 500 copies. And anything that, ever. Anything ever. In the history of our store, the most copies we've sold of any one item is 500 copies. And that includes selling it, wholesaling it to yeah. fellow retailers. And that's not overnight. That's over months. months. And it wasn't a book that cost 5 or $6 or whatever. Uh, this is just, it's, a, it's a $4 book. Is it? Yeah. That's crazy. It's a three ninety nine book. I, I looked it up for this experiment. I assumed it was going to be a so bunch more. It also turns into uh, 10000 and like $54. Yeah. $10,054 for these 4,100 copies that I basically somebody on the boards had said, have you seen DC's new incentives for their next Midtown exclusive cover? 
Yeah, it's it's an awful lot. I, I think there's probably, as as always, when they do these insane levels, like three or four accounts that could probably make that happen. Midtown's definitely one of them. Uh, multi-store chains could probably make that happen. Stores that are hosting gigantic signings with one or both artists could probably make that happen. Um, and let's say we have this. Now, one thing I want to mention, though, when we would do these sort of things, we would kind of emphasize to, to our publishing partners when we've done stuff like the Lumberjanes cover, be a puppy cat. We only want to do this if we can sell it for cover price. So when these deals are, you know, less than a normal discount or an assumption of six or seven dollar cover prices, we don't want to do them because we want something that's comparable to what the normal cover is. We don't want to be having to push something on people that is more expensive than the regular cover. The only way these numbers ever work for any account, including Midtown, that does them is if you're already going to charge more than cover price for them. Like, yes. We would have to have the normal Freddie Williams cover at $3.99. We'd have to have the Challengers Color Store exclusive variant for $8 to $10. Um, and then we'd have to have the black and white variant for about $15. Yep. That's how these prices would normally work. And even when I was thinking about this, as, as we, we joked about how we proceed with it, I realized we would, like... We would have to try that. We would have to basically shrug our shoulders and go, it's an experiment. We're going to see what happens. You know, just because we feel uncomfortable with it, maybe 2,500 people don't feel uncomfortable with it. They're fine paying 10 bucks for it. They're more than fine. They're happy to do it. You know? Like, basically giving up and saying, I, f I think this is gross. I think it's detrimental to the industry. But you know what? Tired of being poor. And starting in January 2016... Variant covers at ten dollars, yeah. twenty five dollars, and fifty dollars a piece. There's a point where you have your principles, and there's a point when you can pay your bills. Those don't always coincide. <laughs> it's nice when they do, always, but ever, but in general, they don't a whole lot. So, I mean, there's a point where you just look around and go, "Everyone's getting rich off of this, except for me." You know? Yeah, I got my principles. I also got a lot of debt. You know? Yeah. Just saying. So we were joking about. The possibility of could because you get to pick your artist for yeah. these covers, and for Dark Knight Three, it was uh, it was a listers, you know, it was sure. Jim Lee and it was Darwin Cook and, and it Murphy. was Sean. Well, I said a listers. <laughs> Come on, Sean Murphy and Jay Lee, right? And yeah. Uh, so I joked that for Batman Turtles, it would be uh, Tom Grummet, <laughs> Tom Grinberg, and <laughs> Tom Grinberg and uh, Barry Kitson. Uh -huh. uh, but then Dal said. Well, I, I, the wheels turn for like half a second and I'm like, the criteria I would have would be like, it would need to be someone who we could, who we knew personally that might want to do it. It would need to be somebody that would have fun with it. And it, it would, again, because it was local, it would need to be someone that we could have in like for an event to move more of these copies. Yeah. And the, the person that fit all those criteria was Ryan Brown. We should get Ryan Brown to do it. Huge TMNT fan. Ryan Brown, Brown loves the turtles, man. He loves them. Um, and as soon as you said that, you're like, wait a minute. Yeah. All of a sudden it was like, you were telling me all this information as a, can you believe this sort of thing? Well, I believe I, I joke, approached like, it. Wait a second. <laughs> uh, I've, I, I've been looking for a new car mm -hmm. and I cannot, to save my life, get a car loan. Nope. And I keep lowering my car standards mm -hmm. and keep getting shot down. So I came to you and said, hey, do, do you, you need it to be not on fire? I think maybe, like, go call a car dealer and go, do you have any on fire? I'll take one that's on fire. I got a fire extinguisher. We can make this happen. I believe that the car model, the manufacturers call that one en fuego. Mm -hmm. And I said to Dal, rather than take the money that I would need for a car, let's just buy a turtle variant. Because you can sell the turtle variant and make <laughs> enough to get two cars. Yeah. In, if you two, sell, if two you sell bad it. cars. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. So that's where that came from, and yeah, uh, we are not doing a turtle variant. It'd be great to, man. It would be so much fun to have a Ryan Brown Batman I don't know turtle cover. I mean... Well, you like the turtles. I like the turtles. No, Jimmy no. likes the turtles. I got nothing against the book. I think the book's going to be good. I think it'll sell well. I like the people working on it. Um, I got nothing against teaming up two different fictional characters from comic companies and having them... Fight their villains or whatever. That's great. Sure, go on. Wait, Have you said fun. two that are fictional. So three of the turtles are real. I'm counting the turtles as one character. Oh, um, it's just again, it's the variant thing. It's what are you selling people? You know what? Why? 
why are they paying more for and this ultimately, thing? I like don't... Ryan Brown, but I don't like the idea of saying, well, pay me six more dollars because Ryan Brown did this one. Like, you're, are you buying a story or are you, you buying buy two more comics of different kinds? I'd rather you care as much about what's on the inside as you do what's on the cover. And it doesn't feel like the variant scheme ever rewards that sort of thinking. It, it penalizes it. It's all about getting multiple covers. It's all about paying more for the wrapper, basically. Like, that's so weird. And I admit to and, and liking... By, I, by the way, that's a rapper with a W. I'm not disparaging the hip-hop covers. I'm just saying the thing that's on the outside of the book is not the most important part of the book. It never has been, and it shouldn't be. Like, I, just, it's, uh, I it's like so what weird. they did with the Squirrel Girl prints, with the, the second or third or whatever prints, where sure. each issue was a, a word balloon right. where she says, eats nuts, kicks butts. And I, I think that's valuable because it can kind of help people jump into a series like that. And it's cute and it's fun and it's cover price and i like and, a lot and, of what they did with howard the duck and again we've done it for things like some of the image books that like tokyo ghost has two different covers we carry both of them so you can choose which one you want we would we are not doing it because we want to sell you a more expensive version of a thing you can get for cheaper and it's not to get you to buy both i it's, like it's never to get you to double dip rick ever. and morty cover where they have mr poopy butthole on it yeah, it's close. Just out of nowhere. Yeah, but like I, you just pointed out, those are cover price. Well, and, and those and, are. But well, my, my point was, like, I look at those and think, oh, that'd be cool to own those, but I don't buy them because I don't need them. Here's the thing that I used to have to tell somebody who worked for Challengers. We had an employee who enjoyed variant covers and, and thought they looked cool and wanted to own them and had what you had, which was that sort of gut reaction of, like, I'd like to own that. And the thing I had to tell this person was, what are you going to do with it when you own it? Okay, you bought it. You looked at it. Then what? You're going to file it away in a box. You're never going to see it again. Right now, on your computer, on your cell phone, on your laptop, you can pull up that image, make it a desktop, put it in a folder, look at it whenever you want. That's free. It's out there. You don't have to pay money for that. All you're getting is the image on the book. Like, what good is that going to do you? You're not going to frame it. It's just going to get filed away, so who even cares? And if we had all of the TMNT store variants at cover price, that guarantees that most people would not buy the regular cover, of which we oh, had to buy, you know, almost 100 of those. And again, you'd have to mark it up because... Very few stores who would order a variant cover like that are going to move 4,000 copies of it. It's just not going to happen. So you have to be making way more than cover price off of each one to account for the hundreds you're never going to sell. Possibly thousands you're never going to sell. Now, the, the covers that we did for Lumberjanes and Being Puppycat, A, Being Puppycat was not supposed to happen. No, that was an accident. <laughs> um, it... It, wa it wasn't an accident, it's just that... There was a miscommunication. Yeah, so basically, Boom has accident. set rules for what they do for variants, and we came to them and said, we cannot do that, but we want to push this book, and we're going to have Noel Stevenson out, we really want to do a cover. So they broke their own rule for us and basically said, okay, we'll do this for you, but never again and never for anybody else. Mm -hmm. And we had also been talking to them about a Bee and Puppy Cat cover because we were also trying to do the same type of event for that. But when we were told we could not get Natasha, mm -hmm. we had said, all right, we're not doing it. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, we, <laughs> we got our invoice. invoice. We can go, hey, wait a second, 500 yeah. copies of a Bee and Puppy Cat. What? And again, 500 copies is was them doing like the challenger's favor right. so then we get a point where they didn't want to do it and we didn't want it but we're both stuck right i mean they already printed it it was on our invoice so yeah like, so we just ate it we were, we're like all right we'll make this work uh i remember when you saw the cover for being puppy cat and you're like i this is a terrible cover for the store and then every challenger's girl's like this is so great right. so it worked out That's right fun. uh we still have those but Mm -hmm. Lumberjanes is long gone. Our Amazing Spider-Man cover is long gone. Yeah. And even that, like, Marvel got such a great reaction from, what, 100 retailers or so? 
Yeah. Because they, they made the the buy-in really low. The buy-in was 500 copies. Yeah, that was great. It was like, we can make that. With Spider-Man and getting Ryan Stegman, who did the cover, to come in, like, we can make that happen. Sure. Yeah. But and now it, that it they... It wasn't super easy. Don't get me wrong. Like, that was another one where it took right. a while and some wholesaling to move through 500 copies. But now they've changed all of their store exclusives to a minimum of 3,000. Yeah. Because... That's what Midtown will buy. <laughs> well, because that's... They only need one retailer to do it, not six. Yeah. So I understand why they're doing it. It's just, like, we will... No, and I think it's also just you make it something where someone's chasing it. If you make it easy, people buy 500. You make it difficult, like, maybe they push themselves and get 1,000, you know? So I'm not saying we'll never do another store exclusive cover again. I... And we have had offers recently, even for low numbers, but for books that we're like, we, we can't, that's not going to work for us. Yeah, I, again, like, we would look at it just as a way of being able to get behind something we're really passionate about and being able to, to give people a little something extra for, for picking it up. It's not the other way around where we're just trying to kind of rake people over the coals who are excited about something. And yet, again, that's what the rest of the industry is doing, so maybe we should get on board with that. Yeah. You know? Of it, all of it, our... It doesn't seem like that attitude is hurting a lot of other stores. Yeah. I know. And you, you phrase it the exact same way I think about it is, we can't pay our r monthly rent with principles. Uh-huh. I mean, understand that every time that, that we, you know, someone comes in and they're excited about incentive covers and we go, no, we don't carry them. Like, they don't care about our principles. They care that we don't have the thing they want. Right. That's it. The end. We didn't change anyone's mind. We didn't, like, broaden perspectives. We didn't make them rethink supply and demand. We narrowed their perspective. And they, how they detrimental... thought that from now on I can't shop at that a, store. A speculator mindset is to an industry. They don't care about any of that. And I don't know that the, the people who do shop with us who don't care about those things care that we don't care about right. them. Do you know what I mean? No, like, it, it, yeah, absolutely. I. It's like when I go to Chipotle and they're all like, no GMOs. Like, I don't care about that. If it I, tastes good, you eat it. I care about my quesadilla. I also eat chicken from, like, Wendy's. Like, I'm sure Wendy's has a billion chemicals in their chicken. It doesn't bother me. I don't care. I really feel like this is elaborating more on the question we had from last episode. Whereas, no, we're never going to do it to... Shit, I don't know. Maybe. I, again, it's... There's a reason why people who are constantly making, like, principled stands and stuff are wealthy. Because they can literally and figuratively afford to make those stands. It's very difficult when you're trying to eke out a living to make those same stands. Because you're basically watching everybody who's awful making a ton of money. While you have your principles and no money. Like, that's... I don't know that you can do that indefinitely without really starting to resent a lot of different things. So the... I don't know what the answer is. I honestly don't. Somebody on one of the boards had said that uh, 10 years ago he opened his first store. Today he's starting construction on a second. And while this literally gets harder every single day, we're still doing it. Mm -hmm. Hooray! Hey, hooray! So looking back at a month's worth of all new, all different Marvel number ones, and I know it's a slow rollout of 20 books-ish, whatever, mm -hmm. are there any breakout sales hits? I mean, I haven't looked at the whole month's sales. I've been really happy with how Doctor Strange is done. It's a book that we took a gamble on. We yeah. were pretty excited about it. We ordered really high on. Um, and I think that's performed well. Uh, I, I mean, real quickly, the one thing I kind of want to talk about, I don't know if you were going to get into this, is um, you had mentioned that, that the general response has, has been, amongst the retail community, somewhat underwhelmed by how Marvel's all-new, all-different first month is done. And there were a bunch of things that when we talked about all new, all different Marvel um, early in the, the year, is they were sort of locking down how things were going to go and what they were going to do. I thought they had a lot of positives. I thought they had a lot of things that, that in their corner that made them more reliable as a, a sales force than DC did when they did the, uh, the New 52 stuff in 2011. I think they've got better creators. I think they've got better characters. I think they're moving from a position of strength, which is that they were already the number one publisher, and they're looking to kind of exploit that and bring a lot of new readers to the table. They've got hugely successful movie franchises. 
Marvel as a company in a lot of ways is firing on all cylinders, and so the idea seemed to be, let's make the publishing as much of a powerhouse as we possibly can. And I thought the one thing they needed to do, really do to make that happen, is advertise outside the industry. That was the thing that DC did in 2011, and it, it made a huge impact on drawing new readers into comic shops by making sure that tons of blogs and magazines and newspapers were covering the New 52, that it had a very easy-to-understand premise, all new number ones in September, jump on points for every single character. People tried out a ton of books. People were excited about it and energized by it. The books weren't very good, and that's the problem long-term. But short-term, it absolutely did its job. So the idea of Marvel's doing this with better characters, better creators, you know, stronger editorial infrastructure, they know how to make this happen. You know, it's just the classic thing of, like, if we could just get these books into people's hands. And I think one of the problems with this month, amongst, you know, every other problem that retailers might cite, is the fact that Marvel didn't really do much that I could see to pull in outside readers. It seemed like all of their promotion for all new, all different Marvel was like Inside Secret Wars and preview comics to comic shops that came out to the, the first, customers the who first were week there. of October. Yeah. Um, stuff on like Newsarama and CBR and Comics Alliance and The Beat. It's like, I, no, it needs to be other places. So while they probably had like a story or something in USA Today four months ago, what we needed was the month of September, Marvel, as a, as a Disney subsidiary, harnessing that promotional muscle and getting people who've never been to a comic shop to know that they should go to a comic shop in October and pick up all these new Marvel comics. And they didn't do that. And so, yeah, it's going to be underwhelming compared to retailer expectations. Look at all their internal press for Iron Man House saying, this is the linchpin book, this is the book... This is the, the centerpiece of the Marvel Universe dinner table. This is the, the flowers in the middle of the table. This is the, the starting point, the, the instigator, the jump on point. And all they did was tell that to us. Yeah. I, we haven't seen, honestly, any that I can think of brand new customers coming in saying, i got to get these Marvel books. I need to sign up for these Marvel titles. The month of August in 2011... I, man, I, it, it must have been a half dozen people who came in and said, I got to get these books when they come out. And then once September happened, probably another dozen. Yeah. And th this is the first month of Marvel doing it, and people are adding titles. You know, comics fans are getting more comic books. That's great. But it's not going to hit the highs that it should because you don't have the people who have seen the Guardians of the Galaxy movie or Ant-Man or the Avengers coming in and saying, like, I gotta get this new Guardians book, this new Ant Man book, this new Avengers book. Like they're not. They're Have not they doing ever anything. advertised the comics on one of the DVD releases? Um, not that I've seen. Even like a comic shop locator service number or something, just, just to something. say. But again, like that's that's the problem. Like they should have somehow been able to, through the Disney hierarchy, figured out a way to get this thing press and publicity and it's like no one cared like the publishing company just did what the publishing company always does and they worked with the resources they had instead of having the full you know the full weight of disney no man them. we work with the resources they have they have untapped resources well, that's what i'm saying no no they they don't they have tapped resources they have a very specific you are a publishing company and you have this much revenue and you have this much budget what they should have been able to do was again, kind of reach out within their massive corporation and have something on ESPN, have something on ABC and ABC Family or whatever the fuck ABC Family is called now, uh, have uh, trailers... I in think it actually is whatever the fuck. Trailers in front of Ant-Man or whatever, like something where it's like, go to comic shops in September. Like, you could even just say the first week of September because you've got Amazing Spider-Man, Iron Man, Doctor Strange, like... You've got big titles, and they're right there, and you didn't tell anybody. So you're going to get stuff where it's going to sell the best that comic stores can make it sell. But if you'd sent, you know, 500,000 new customers into the comics industry, all of these books would be selling so much better. Yep. So much better. And even but the you can't publicity... sell books to people who don't come in. 
the press that Captain America got for, I don't want to say the wrong reasons, but not for the... I think they knew that would happen. All that did was get existing customers to add it to their list. And, like, it's a book that... It's a sales success for us because we've had a reorder, but we were we were, super, yeah, we were pushing it. I right. don't think it had as much to do with, with the Fox News. But, stuff. I mean, that that helped us push it. Yeah, but we were pushing it the week before that happened. But that was a book that we had very low expectations yeah, for. So it was we good. we ordered low, and so we're ordering more just to be yeah. like, oh, we can go, we can do something it with is, this. It is ridiculous to me that in the first month of, of a long-term initiative that Marvel is having... To relaunch all of their books with new number ones, jump on points, quality creative teams. That the the thing that's moving the needle in September is hip hop October. variants. October, sorry. Like that that that. It's not the content even. Yeah. It's that you did hip hop covers. Like that's the it's thing that the, people again, are talking about. Attended, the rapper and calling for and picking up is the is the hip hop variants. Like that's so backwards. <laughs> that should be additive. That shouldn't be. The thing that's making this successful, Amazing Spider-Man number one should be the thing that's making Amazing Spider-Man number one successful. It's, it's, oh my god, it's the dumbest thing. One of the things that DC does in their weekly emails is they give a press roundup. Mm -hmm. Here's our books in the press across the nation this week. Marvel doesn't do that. Marvel doesn't even do a, uh, or their weekly email is, here are these new variant covers. Mm -hmm. Uh, here's these new second or third prints the, or whatever. They're going to start doing hip-hop variants for uh, subsequent issues of their series. Axel oh, Alonso right. said in the new Axel okay. in Charge. Because, again, that's the success story of all new, all different Marvel is hip-hop variants. So we're going to do more of those. Like, that's... If that's the takeaway, like... I, man, then it is a failure. Then and all new, I, all different Marvel's already failed. I think I've already complained about this before, how we do get press releases from Marvel, sometimes a couple a day, mm -hmm. promoting their new series, but it's stuff that's already broken on all of the comics journalism sites. Sure. We get it last. And I, I don't feel we should get it last. I feel we should get it same time, at least. No, I, I agree with the way they do it, because if Comics Retailers got it first, who would actually get it first? The Comics Retailers. Leading Cool would get it first. No, so, they get so it second. It, no, no, they get it first. They would the the second a retailer got it, they'd already be forwarding it to Bleeding Cool. I don't know. I don't like when somebody wants to add a book that I have yet to hear about. Uh, so no, yeah. If they didn't send it to all news sites first, no, I'm saying send it to us at the same time as that. I think. I mean, honestly, I think they might be. It's just a matter of how long it takes a server to send out a bunch of emails. I don't know. It's it's not a huge time difference necessarily. Sometimes it's three days. Okay, I don't get those emails. So I don't, I don't usually know. Like I get it from comics news sites. I just don't feel like we are a partner to them, but I never have. We're, so we're that's, not. that's that's also not. We're not talking about that. Yeah, I mean that's I I would. I don't know that I would term us a partner in, in what they do. I. But speaking of sending things out to people, uh -huh. we talked about this last week, but I think that. Today especially was the day that we saw returns. Yeah, we figured it out, I think. Um, the first week we, we'd sent out um, our emails to all of our subscribers about what items they'll be receiving on the next Wednesday. Um, it was our first time doing it, and it kind of took a bit longer to put it together than it, it normally would. Um, so it went out like Saturday evening, which was not ideal. It was not how we, we meant it to go out. So knowing what we what we know now, we uh, designed it so it would go out Friday morning, uh, and that obviously seemed like it was a much better time for people to get stuff. And uh, again, like it going out Saturday night was not, you know, a, a long thought over decision. That was just when it was ready, it went out. So we made sure it was ready Friday morning. At the same time, that was when we would send our normally our normal weekly email, mm -hmm. to which I thought, well, we should probably reschedule that. So I asked on. Uh, my Facebook, the store's Facebook, and Twitter, mm -hmm. when people would prefer to get it, emphasizing the day of the week and the time of day. Uh -huh. And we got maybe a total of four replies. Uh, that's typical. One of them was Tuesday. No, nope, it's not going to be the day before books. Uh, one of them was, I like it exactly when it is on Friday so I can see what books to add before the Sunday cutoff. 
that was by a club member, sure. so that is being replaced by the email that he gets right. with that, so that, that doesn't matter. With, with all that information. Okay. Yeah. Uh, somebody who doesn't shop with us said Monday okay. at noon. Nope. Uh, someone said Tuesday, and then two people, two club members who get the new email said the same as it always was. Mm-hmm. So it would never be later than Sunday. Never. No. I really don't see the the. Well, use when of it. I posed this question to fellow retailers months ago, the majority answer was Monday. I don't get that. That feels yeah. like way too late to notify people of stuff. And there's to, as you know to be valuable to you. As you know, I'm subscribed to a lot of different stores newsletters, and uh-huh. I, there's a bunch I get Tuesday night and Wednesday morning. Yeah, I. I don't know that the Thursday is ideal. Um, I. You you hit a really good point a long time ago when you said that, that you don't like it to kind of step on the toes of the this week's books. Yeah. So it's a thing where I, I don't know that it couldn't be Friday or Saturday even. It can be Saturday. And and I just I tried to think I, I, about I, it. I think doing it later in the day on Friday isn't even a bad idea. Like yeah. do it like doing it at like three or four on Friday, people are done with work as far as they're concerned. Yeah, we'll we'll try that next week. We did Thursday at three o'clock this week. Mm-hmm. But I won't know the open rates until later. Sure. And I wouldn't expect open rates to even out until it was a established time. But sure. I don't know. Um, so far from your initial batch, mm-hmm. we, we've updated at least three email addresses. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we, we didn't have any bounces this time. I got, there was a note waiting for me at the store that a club member had called mm-hmm. to say, hey, I don't get the weekly email anymore. Okay. So... I went into the account today and looked it up because he blocked it. Oh, <laughs> it, it's blocked. Okay. So I I emailed and he said, was, he, "What do you like? Mark it as spam or just deleted it?" It just times? it just said blocked by okay. email address. All right. So I took that error message, cut it and pasted, it, and I said, "Look, here is the message we got. Here is the day that happened. You haven't gotten any emails since then. Uh, normally, when that happens, it just shuts me out of this. Like it shuts me out of your." account altogether but for some reason it let me put your email address back in today so maybe next week maybe however you should be getting this new email every week that tells you what's exactly in your your Mm -hmm. pulls and it has the same list of what new releases are just doesn't have the events and things and then i looked i'm like oh he's not getting anything like like the last week or this week so (laughs) he won't have gotten this email yet but that's the the thing about the email you don't get the email the subscriber what's in your box email Unless you have something coming in next yeah. week. So, yeah, two weeks in a row, I've gotten it just fine. Yeah, same uh, Mike Weed sent it to us and said this is what it looks like on mobile, but I didn't notice any difference. Um, there's a couple things I noticed um, either through the one I got um, as a subscriber and then the ones that I would see getting back from people. Just weird things where, it, like, the thing that you had mentioned the week before, where there's a typo because it... You oh, put, it added a space. It added I a space. I noticed that wasn't in... All of them. It was in one of them. Right. And the, the same thing happened this time where in the, the opening paragraph... They put in a number? They put an extra space in something. And then what I'd see in some of the... Um, uh, the the small section where it's what you're getting next week should be enclosed in, like, a grid. Yeah. And when it becomes, like, quoted text, that grid becomes, like, anything. It could be any character. So yeah, I would I would get stuff back from people and I'd say like, oh, that doesn't look right, but it probably looked okay to them when they got it. Yeah, it's always different in the the yeah. So I, I think some of that, field. but it, it, overall, all the information is there and it's all readable and legible. Uh, along those lines, we've learned that half of our email subscribers who actually open our weekly email do it on a device versus their computer, mm-hmm. and our our Tumblr specifically. When Tumblr copies the WordPress challengers assemble to it, on screen, it looks great. On a mobile device, it's just HTML code. Mm, no, no photos, just code. And that's also what it would do when it would forward from Tumblr to Facebook or Twitter. It would only post that as HTML. Weird. So I would immediately have to go in and delete those. Um, it was Gina Challenger who pointed out today. She's like, look what it looks like on my phone, and I go, well, this is what I see on the screen. And she's like, yeah, but look at the phone. Mm-hmm. And that's a, a definitely a factor. That means I don't know that Challengers Assemble will be copying to 
Tumblr anymore. Okay. But also, I think it might be done. Assemble? Yeah. Uh, uh, two weeks from now is epi- episode. Uh, is week 200. And is that the, the Dark Knight one? No, Dark Knight's next week at 199. Okay. 200 is just a free-for-all. Okay. Um, what I did like six weeks of themes at once just because I wanted to establish the Dark Knight one and sure. I wanted Supergirl on there for the TV show sure. premiere. And uh, I realized, well, that's just up to 200. Let's just, it's too far out for me to know it's coming out for sure. Let's just make it a free for all. Mm-hmm. But I think that I'm going to let it go because it's mainly the same two guys <laughs> who do it every week. Sure. With a third guy who rotates in often. As a matter of fact, after I set everything up this, mo- like this morning at, uh, you know, at midnight, mm-hmm. when I got to the store this morning, I got an email from the another contributor of, like he's like an eighty percent contributor. Okay. Uh, he's like, hey, I did three this week, but I forgot to mail them to you. Here they are now. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna email uh, Archangelo and Tom Kelly and say, you guys are the ones keeping this alive. What do you want to do? Mm-hmm. But it, it is a point now where it's I mean, a, it's a lot of work for you. This is almost four years. I mean, January first yeah. will be the four year anniversary. Sure, I think that's plenty. I do too. I just I'm not good at letting things go. No, I understand. Uh, we were talking seriously. Actually, it's, it came out of a conversation with Mike Lee, but the return of the webcam. <laughs> we'll see. Um, because it's it's more practical. I mean, it's easier to do now. Yes. Uh, it's always something that I thought was a Te- great idea. Technologically, it's easier to yeah. do. Yeah. I always thought it was a great idea, and it was something that you sure. had come up with from the very beginning. Mm. And, you know, when we eventually do get Super Chunk to play, who's going to be able to see it? Absolutely. Right. Well, like my phone. What if you're not there? That because you'll passed out from excitement. That is completely not what would. <laughs> well, you'll be at our uh, Peoria store. That's right. Yeah, um, we were. I was talking to Scotty Young this week about a signing he did at Third Eye in uh, Annapolis, Maryland, and there were people in tents who camped out the night before. And lines down the block. And Third Eye always gets these this kind of turnout for their events. Yeah, I mean, they, they've they got... If people ever thought, like, we did a lot of events, Third Eye does a lot of events. And they do them with absolutely everybody. And they're constantly, like, bringing people in, doing exclusive covers, having huge signings with, like, multiple creators from multiple books. And I would love to do that. And they're about as old as we are. I would love it, but holy shit, like, do their signings dwarf even our biggest signing? Like, the signings they have with people where I'm like, who's going to care about that? Get more people than our A-list, A-list signings. Yeah. Like, I don't... And We've then, done signings with the same people to a fraction of the turnout. Yeah. And we've, we've talked to people who've done their events, like, who, who have been guests of theirs, like, to pick their brains, like, how is this happening? Like, what is it they're doing that's getting, like, 10 to 20 times as many people to turn out for an event? Like, how are they doing it? And we got some good advice and some things we try to take on board and do things differently with. But it's it's just, like, we... The only thing we can figure out is, like, they're in Annapolis, Maryland, and we're in Chicago, and Chicago doesn't care about events. Like, basically, that was... The thing that we heard from a couple different people. We've we've had uh, creators who did signings there and have done signings in different stores in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And they say, like, the turnout of Chicago stores, not just Challengers, but Chicago yeah, stores, just is, Chicago. is very low. Like, signings that would be shut down or capped after four hours in a different city, there's, like... Maybe, maybe 50 people, which, by the way, 50 people at a signing would be huge. Yeah. When we really step it up and really push for things like Gustavo Duarte or Joel Jones or uh, even more recently uh, Dylan Horrocks, Mm -hmm. we get just enough people that we're not super depressed about it, Mm -hmm. but nothing to... uh, match the excitement that we have for these creators. Yeah. And I mean, it's just the the financials of doing it. Like, if you're getting 
three and four hundred people to show up for a signing, it makes it incredibly easy to bring out guests all the time because it costs money again to fly people out and put them up for the weekend or whatever. Uh, some of the stuff the Third Eye does, which is phenomenal, that uh-huh. we we could never do, is they have like special Annapolis centric gift baskets sure. in the hotels for these people. Well, the, the hotel thing is one of those things that that we would love to do, but the problem is there are no hotels nearby us. Yeah. Like. Some of the ways things like that happen are you form a, a business relationship with that hotel, and that hotel appreciates the business you bring them, so they work hard for it. We, we, don't, briefly, we don't have that, so what we get is, you know, no help from the concierge at, like, the Holiday Inn Express or whatever. Like, we've never put someone up at a Holiday Inn right. Express, but we that's have the to, equivalent. We have to uh, put people up in Lakeview, because that's the closest yeah. decent hotels. And briefly, we had a, a relationship with one of them, but then they changed their rules. Uh, they were like a corporate sponsor, or I don't remember what it was called, what, what, we were, what was called what we had with mm-hmm. them. But they then suddenly they upped the, the rules to, like, you had to have 12 guests a year. Yeah. And we don't, we don't have that. No. To be able to get corporate pricing, right. basically, is what it was. Uh, but then they also have, like, these, Third Eye does these, uh, crazy limited gifts for the first 25 people in line mm-hmm. that are built around the theme of the event. And I've never actually known what's what they are, but sometimes it's a limited edition print. Sometimes it's... Uh, they do a lot of their own in-store merch, like coasters or buttons or, or right. T-shirts or what have you. Things like that. Um, but we don't do that because we can't guarantee 25 people will show no, up. that's true. <laughs> But yeah, I, I just, it's not, it's not a challenger's problem. It's a city of Chicago problem, yeah. but it's still embarrassing. It's frustrating more, I think, more than it's embarrassing because it's, I, but I see, I don't know. I was about to say like, you know, we want to bring these great events to Chicago, but we can't, but it's like, Chicago doesn't want them. Then why do we want to bring them? Who yeah. cares? Like, yeah. I, not to, to loop this all the way back around to uh, the variant cover thing, but I mean, maybe it's just our view is not the popular view. Like, we think we're doing everyone a favor. Maybe we're not. You know? Yeah. Maybe our view of, of a store, of what we want to do, of what people want, is totally off base and completely out of step. Maybe that's it, you know? It's very easy in a sort of echo chamber environment of you and I talking to one another to think that, like, we've got our finger on the pulse of the comics industry. And that industry, we, industry, yeah. industry, industry. That we know... I'm adding the echo chamber effect. I got it. Um, that we I know... Was, I was telling that Matt. Okay. Uh, that we know what we're doing. That we are, are giving people what they want. Like, we're doing the best thing. And it's like, I don't know, maybe we're not. You know? Maybe we're doing what we think is right, but that doesn't make it right. That doesn't make it better. Well, we had a guy in today who is new to the area, and he used to shop at Chicago Comics, and he lived right there. He was right there. It was, like, he was right off the red line. It was mm-hmm. so convenient. And while he's close to us, he's not super convenient, but it was his first time in the store. He bought a stack of trades, raved about the place. That's nice. So whenever you hear that, you're like, yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Because it wasn't followed up with, uh, wow, if I lived closer, I'd be here all the time. <laughs> or, this place is so great, I promise I'm going to come back and buy something next time. Uh-huh. It was actually while he was buying, like, I, three or four trades, my, saying... My least favorite variation on that is the... Ah, oh, this is such a great store. I don't read comics, but I'm going to tell my friends who do. Hey. Like, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'd never buy anything here, but I'll be sure to mention you to people who will. Uh, great, thanks. Thank you for that. And I'd like the stack of free bookmarks, please. Huh? What's your most expensive comic book? <laughs> you know I've got comics in my mom's house. What are they worth? Yep. Uh, I can't remember who it was, but somebody had just... Uh, uh, they overheard me on the phone doing a, I'm sorry, we didn't buy anything. And they said, how many times a day do you have to say that? Like, I don't know. Oh, man, that, that was a Wednesday. I was there. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can't remember who said it either. I'm like, oh, just a lot. Uh-huh. Just a, a lot. Whole, a whole lot of times. Most of the time. Uh, we, had, we had a guy come in today dropping off a resume. Mm-hmm. And he had talked to you, and I can't remember what about specifically, uh, Outcast. Okay. And he he was looking for Liz Prince books. Here we have a bunch. Okay, great. Looked at them, put them back. Mm-hmm. Then, uh, do you have any Chris Onstead books? 
Uh, who, who does Aikwood? Mm-hmm. You're okay. right. Chris Honstead. Uh, like I, they don't. Aikwood's not in print anymore. I mean, we we can't. We can't he, get he hasn't it. published a new strip in like All almost right. well, two years. Where's your Harvey Picard section? Like everything I brought him to, he'd look at it, not buy anything. Mm-hmm. And like you're with, hired with Liz <laughs> Prince, like I'm definitely gonna come back for that. Okay. Like all right, I I appreciate. Uh, maybe you're just trying to show me your knowledge of books, but. You're keeping me from helping yeah. other people. Boy, this right is now. a lot of extra work for no sales. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I'm not. I don't want to sound mercenary about it, but there were other people I could have been helping. Well, like in in situations where someone's like, "Do you have any Liz Prince? Do you have any Harvey Pekar? Do you have any Chris Onstead?" Putting the Chris Onstead thing aside, which is they did three books, and I don't even know if any of them are even still in print because the last new Dark Horse collection was published like four years ago. Um. When you're shown a section of Harvey P. Card books, of Liz Prince books... Well, that's just it. We didn't have any Harvey P. Card books in that section. Oh, okay. Well, Liz, let's take the Liz yeah. Prince one. Yeah. Do you have any Liz Prince books? We do, right here. And then you flip through into my, I'm like, help me out. Like, what were... You, were you looking for a different Liz Prince book? Were you looking for not these? Like, we can narrow this down. Un- unless the answer was, I was looking for these, but I was also not planning on buying them. In which case... <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> so, uh, Gina Challenger got married recently, and she was on her honeymoon in Portland, which is one of her favorite, like, her favorite city. And she was in a store, maybe Floating World, um, but she wanted to show her husband Headlopper. Mm-hmm. And she couldn't find it, so she goes to that, and she's like, hey, do you have Headlopper? And the guy's like, I'm really sorry we sold out. She's like, oh, that's okay. And he's like, well, you can buy my copy. And she's like, no, that's okay. He's like, no, it's okay. I don't mind. You can, you can buy mine, because he had one on hold. And she had to say... I don't need to buy it. I just wanted to show it to him, but I already own a copy back in Chicago. This was never going to be a sale. You were never going to make $6 off of this or $8 (laughs) or whatever had Lopper costs. No, it's okay. You buy mine. It's okay. I appreciate that. No. (laughs) I was never planning on buying it. I'm sorry. I already got mine at a discount like two months ago. (laughs) That's okay. (laughs) Damn funny story, though. Sure. Yeah, I just wanted to show him. And uh, today, obviously... Batman t-shirts, uh, costume apparel, things like that. Yeah, uh, this time of year, there's a lot of, like, do you have lantern rings? Not a and, single and one of them. if there's one thing I could suggest, DC Direct make a perennial item, just a green lantern ring in a cardboard box. Charge $10 for it. We would sell 50 of those Around in October. Halloween. Yeah. Like, that's, everybody always want lantern rings, and they don't understand, like, they don't just make those all the time. They make them every 10 years when they do a Green Lantern event. And we can't necessarily stock up because how many Green Lantern rings do you need for 10 years? Um, none of the people who came in looking for theme t-shirts mm-hmm. wanted in, in its place a Deathstroke mask. <laughs> but I pitched it to everybody. That's nice. Uh, Weirdly, maybe for Christmas. Oh, man. We had... <laughs> We had somebody come in today who's looking at sidekicks and come out and said to to his wife. Actually, I think it was more to me. Who would buy a giant hobgoblin figure? <laughs> I can think of one. And minute. I said, funny story. <laughs> we didn't order that for uh-huh. the shelf. It's on the shelf now. And he goes, I guess every store has one of those, don't they? Uh-huh. <laughs> Who would buy that? Uh, we don't know. But if you do... <laughs> Tell your, it your, could be you. Tell your comic-loving <laughs> friends about this. It could be you. Maybe, maybe they'll... they'll Comes with a goblin that. glider. Come on. That's right. Just tell that story. Knocked another story out, too. Damn, okay. damn it. Sorry. Uh, no, it was my fault. I was the one who, who uh, went a different way, and I hoped by stalling like this I could think about it. But, but no. it turns out that I cannot. No. Nope. 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 So yeah, no, no death strokes is sold. No, uh, somebody came in looking for Alan Moore stuff for costume. Like, hey, the Vendetta mask that we sold a while ago. Never mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, don't don't have it. Don't have it anymore. I think it's worthwhile to keep like uh, Court of Owls mask or the Joker yeah, face probably. mask. I mean, that's what we did last year. Yeah, just bef- like mid October, we ordered you know the Death of the Family box set and uh, yeah, Court of but Owls I, I and think... V for Vendetta. Like. So maybe we missed out on that, but I don't but know. But I, like, I mean, just like as a perennial, something to always have in sidekicks. I don't know about sidekicks. Well, I mean, that's, that's where. But I mean, it's it. where the it's a toy. It's where the masks would go. It is also creepy. They're creepy. They're all creepy. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
I did remember what I was going to say is that in the new previews they offer a Flash TV show, Mr. Freeze Gun. Yes. And it is mounted on a stand, and we had a, a customer expressing interest in getting it. Mm-hmm. If we can tell him that it comes off of the stand. Yeah, if it's not, like, adhered to it some way. So we emailed DC, and the answer is, they don't know yet. Okay, well, they should figure that out. Did I forward that answer to you today? You did did not. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. I went to uh, just message you, but you were offline. Okay. So, yeah, the the, the answer came back is... I was going to see Steve Jobs. They're not sure yet... They're still working on it. Okay, they really should figure that out. We'll let you know. Because that's the between someone buying a $300 Captain Cold gun or someone buying a $300 paperweight. Uh, unrelated to that, but I recently, at a checkout counter, bought a like a $10 Memorial John Wayne magazine for my dad. Okay. And um, a few weeks after I gave it to him, he showed me an ad. I don't know if it came from there or from somewhere else, but like one of these... like. Franklin Mint or Bradford Exchange, we're doing a replica John Wayne gun wall hanging. Mm, cool. And he showed me the coupon. I'm like, all right, whatever. And I pretended to throw it away. But I, I secretly took it home and bought it for him for Christmas. Nice. And it showed up today at the store. I hope your dad doesn't listen to this podcast. He does not listen to this podcast. Uh, no one in my family does. No one in my family listens okay. to this podcast. That's true. Uh, so it showed up today. It is a colossal piece of shit. Oh, wow. As advertised in a magazine, even. Um, Surprising. The uh, it's a wall hanging only, so the holster is sculpted. The gun is scu- it's one piece. The gun is sculpted into it. It, it, it doesn't, has to be. Doesn't come out. If if that thing could come out, they could not sell it in America. Like you would have to have like a plug in it or something, or like a you, big orange yeah top, to, which is fine if it goes in the holster. Anyway, uh, it's also completely flat on hmm. the back because it's a wall hanging. Sure, and it's just such a letdown. I mean, he's yeah, still getting yeah, it. Yeah, to you. Yeah. Maybe to him. He'll be yeah. thrilled. I don't know. Also, like, the, it came in a, not even a box. It was just, like, molded styrofoam, which, of course, got a little styrofoam puffies everywhere. Of course. So I had to throw that out immediately, but wrap it and keep it in the, like, like everything about this is a huge miss. <laughs> I don't even know how to uh, uh, display it for him, because it came banded to cardboard and I don't want to like jam scissors up there to cut it mm-hmm. because it'll scrape the you're forgetting the most important thing about this gift you didn't have to drive out to the middle of nowhere in the cold yeah, on December 24th <laughs> to get it for him <laughs> it's October yes. and it's done yes that's true it's done you yep. own it you can wrap it in your hey, leisure man. uh sorry sorry for the sound effect everybody you never know when there's going to be something else coming I guess. I'm not, like, he's not the only person I'm buying for. Oh, man. Uh, I alternately have a decent chunk of my Christmas shopping done, and then absolutely no ideas for everybody else. I, as a rule, I don't do any Christmas shopping until, uh, day after Thanksgiving. I just don't, yeah. I don't like having to do it that far yeah, in advance. but I also stuff. have to buy for a lot more people than you it's do. It's true. And I just... I mean, I have ideas. I have general ideas of what what things people are going to get, but I don't... I had an idea for you for your birthday that I'm completely shut out from. Okay. That I'm having... Was it a new car? Absolutely no (laughs) luck. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, thanks. Is that funny to you? No, thanks. That's a joke? I don't need one. Thank you. What if you got one and just gave it to me? Yeah, okay. I I would have worse luck than you would. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Not on the podcast, though. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Yeah, I uh, what I thought was a great idea for you, which, by the way, I had a long time ago and never moved on and forgot. Mm-hmm. And then it was when talking with Donovan a few weeks ago. I'm like, oh, yeah, that. And she's like, there's no way you're getting that now. I'm like, are you kidding? What, what I have is, the internet. What is or was I'm it? Not, I'm not. Why? It's not happening. I, so far. I'm okay. still looking. Okay. Uh, also, this whole story is completely oversold it. Okay. <laughs> Lower your expectations. Okay. Oh, that's good. That that sounded like it's managed okay. properly. Uh, I did order a new phone. Yeah. Because my phone has been freaking out so much. It just does these things where it opens and closes and opens and closes, and I can't... Uh, trying to hit the backspace causes all sorts of gibberish. Hmm. 
So... Do you think it's Ray Palmer trying to communicate with you? Uh, it might be. It does keep, like, matrix, matrix coding yeah. the word Felicity. Oh, then maybe it's Carrie Russell. See, that's what I was thinking. Huh. A lot of options. Uh, I, but I hope it's like... A lot of CWWB Pre-season two Felicity. Yeah. I don't know. She's great on the Americans. Uh, I will take your word for it. Um, but also, I had to immediately order a Captain America case for it. Of course. Uh, I went... I still had... Uh, I, I think I saw in the recycler a, uh, the remainders of a red <laughs> bubble gift <laughs> distributing. I'm like... Oh, From two yeah, years ago. What? <laughs> what yeah, guess what? Here? That that wasn't good anymore. No, I'm sorry. It's not your fault. You're the, it's not your fault. I, I'm the one who kept it for two years two after years. the fact. Two years. Two years later. But here's the best part about getting the new phone. Mm-hmm. Um, they do it in, like, uh, I forget, the low end the size of the hard drive. 16. 16, 64. 132. 128. I added them together. Okay. Um, so, my current phone is 64. Yeah, that used to be the high end. Yeah. With the the original 6, they, they upped it to 128, which was, like, unbelievable. Because, because I'm doing this on a monthly payment plan, so mm-hmm. I don't have to put any money down, um, it's only an extra 4 bucks a month to go to the 128. Sure. So, I'm like, yeah, I'll do that. But here's the best part. Because Verizon has new service plans, uh-huh. uh, the annoying thing is is their small is one gig of data a month, mm-hmm. and their medium is three gigs. Mm-hmm. And I was currently at two, mm-hmm. and I never go over two. Um, but even so, going to three is so much cheaper per month for my plan that I'm only paying like an extra two bucks a month than I'm paying now. To pay off the phone. That's cool. So I've been in adjusting my, my phone plan. I can afford this new phone. Now, is this one of those plans where, like, after a year, you give them that phone back and get a new one? No, I'm buying this outright. You're buying it over two years. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I'm also trading my old phone back in mm-hmm. for. I mean, we'll find out once they get it back and determine. Yeah. But it's like roughly 150 to 300 bucks. I would say lower. Than that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if you're trading in it because it's not working well, yeah. look, they I mean, had they, a, can, they can fix some of it. Don't get me they wrong. They had a questionnaire. Does it turn on? Yes. Are any of the program functions repeated? No. Mm-hmm. So, so there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so I'm. I didn't want to get a new phone after only two years because my last iPhone lasted three. Sure. But the phone was freaking out. Yeah. And I didn't want to be like, I can't afford a car, but I got a phone, and I got a phone because they made it. Really easy on a payment plan, sure. Where it's only costing me Which, a handful of dollars in, extra. Per in month. reality, for the car, you'll do a payment plan for that. Like you have no problem. Yeah. Like yeah. I will absolutely do a payment plan, and they're like, no. Yeah. So right, it's kind of the same thing. Just Verizon said, okay. Um, it's been a while since I asked you if you read any graphic novels. Because I haven't read a bunch of them. All right. Well, you know, in a, in a few. I keep meaning to. Well, that's just it. You got a new year coming up soon. You can go back on that graphic we'll, novel. We'll try. Yours. I've been reading older stuff. I've been reading through the Adventure Time graphic novels. Did you read Two Brothers? Not yet. Oh. Um, well, that's, if you heard tapping, that's because I'm, it's right here. I'm tapping it. What else? Uh, I, I just a lot of comics. I mean, there's been so many goddamn comics. It's yeah. Been work just keeping up with those. I read uh, I read Ringside number one today. Oh yeah, how was that? Not great. Hmm. Uh, the art is rougher than I had assumed it was from the previews. Yeah. Um, and the story's okay. I, I kind of don't have a firm grip on exactly what genre they're working in right now. I believe it's called wrestling. I, it's, at best, it seems like wrestling adjacent. You have a... It, it seemed as much sound... wrestling as Rowdy Roddy Piper in They Live. Okay. You know? You have a sound wrestling background, so... It was probably a little more easier for you to follow than... Yeah, I didn't find... Like, I think maybe it'll work best for people who aren't huge into wrestling and they can get a view into that culture that is maybe different than they're expecting. But if you're the sort of person who, you know, reads the dirt sheets and, you know, has pay-per-view predictions, none of this stuff is going to surprise you. In fact, it's going to feel 
a little light on the lingo and the world. Speaking of the lingo, when Dal says dirt sheets, he means wrestling websites that have... But that's, that's why I use that. I, I use know. that term because if, if you know what that term means, I think ringside's going to feel a little bit like it's got the training <sighs> wheels on. You're such a smart. A smart. Um, no, you're not a smart because you're not a mark at all. You are not a mark in any way for this not. industry. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I, I felt like it was barring a little... A little too much from stuff like The Wrestler. Okay. And maybe not as much as I would have liked from the actual modern wrestling landscape. Um, Speaking of wrestling, yeah, I don't know if I can pull this off, uh-huh. but I'm trying to have a well-known in the wrestling industry, let's say personality, Okay. come by the store for Drax number one. Okay. I, I don't want to say anything else about it because I can't guarantee it, uh-huh. but I'm going to see if we can't make it happen. Okay. I just whispered to Dow, and he did like, yeah, I know what you're, I knew yeah, what you were no, saying. I, I figured it I, out. I was, Jim Cornette, what? <laughs> <laughs> so bring your tennis rackets, everybody. <laughs> we paid Ric Flair $15,000 oh, to God. show up. <laughs> to drop an elbow on a Drax number one and walk out. Woo. Uh-huh. Woo. Uh, completely unrelated to that, mm-hmm. CM Punk had posted something to Twitter about Drax number one coming out, and he tagged us, and he tagged Marvel in it. Okay. And, of course, we've gotten hundreds and hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of likes, favorites, retweets, comments, uh, people saying everything from, it's on my calendar, or what kind of dog do you have? Or, John Cena's going to beat you at WrestleMania. Did, did you draw it, too? <laughs> Things like that. I love Spider-Man. All right, great. And then, <laughs> uh, so many of these people are, like, fake punk accounts. That's so strange Right. To me. So, anyway, uh, on Facebook, uh, an, a, a Phil Brooks account, and I put air quotes <laughs> on that, <laughs> posted that exact same thing. So, I go look at this Phil Brooks page, and... Every post on this Phil Brooks page is one of Punk's tweets just reposted to Facebook. Weird. Including one where he's bashing a dude for ripping him off on Instagram oh. because he doesn't have an Instagram account. He's like, I don't have an Instagram. Whoever doing this is a piece of shit. Yeah. Oh, man. So this person who is literally taking, like, making a bullshit Facebook page is posting the things about CM Punk being mad about people doing that shit i wonder if it's the sort of thing where that dude just assumes he's exempt because he and punk are soulmates it's gotta be he knows that and punk knows that so clearly it's not about him because people that crazy lunatic because even though his uh his twitter handle is at cm punk uh uh, the, the name he has is just coach and his profile picture has been for a long time paul newman from slapshot okay so one of like one of these things says, uh, "Coach, favorite tweet you read," and I said, "Wait a minute, he's the one who posted it." But then you hover your mouse over the name, and it's from the Twitter account I C M Punk I. Ugh. Like what, man? I don't get it. I don't get it. It's weird. It's really weird. And I, you, you want to respond back to something, but you don't because no, you don't. You're just feeding into it. Yeah, don't. Oh my god. But I mean, even just like like answering Punk's tweet back, mm-hmm. man, I said tweet like five times today. You remember a couple years ago when I would, I vowed I'd never say the word tweet, I would just say Twitter post, because I thought saying tweet is so dumb. To. Yeah. It's just easier. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I lost. I lost. I. It was a war you were never going to win. No, that's true. It's like someone who vowed, you know, 40 years ago that they would only say photocopy not xerox well that war got lost and then we moved on to something else you know i'm having a hard enough time transitioning from saying kinko's to saying fedex office you don't have to you can just say kinko's and, but i mean kinko's won't exist soon it, uh, it already does but i mean exist. there's still some places that have kinko's branding inside their fedex offices sure ish i don't know yeah ish well i feel like the last 10 minutes of this have really been comic centric so mm-hmm. Thanks for listening. And keep reading comics. There you go. This has been Contest of Challengers. 
Thanks for listening. Keep reading comics. Challengers is located at 1845 Northwestern Avenue in the Bucktown neighborhood of Chicago, 773-278-0155. You can visit Challengers on the web at challengerscomics.com. You can direct email to challengers at challengerscomics.com. You can become a fan on Facebook at facebook.com slash challengerscomics. And you can follow Challengers on Twitter at twitter.com slash challengers. That's so weird. <laughs> Do you even know how to say it? I, I didn't Just, know. Where, what are the words? <laughs> Line? I didn't know if I was supposed to say it or if you're going to try to say it at the exact time to no. Xerox me. No. Huh. I just want to see if I can get you to say it. Maybe next time I'll say it without a question mark. Maybe. <laughs>